Okay, uh, next we're happy to have Samir and Philip, who is originally going to tell us about integral affine structures, but instead he's going to tell us about the affine of exponents and other topics. So, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. It's, it's a great pleasure to be uh, speaking at this conference, and I apologize to the audience for changing the topic. The reason I changed the topic was, will be, I hope, clear as the talk unfolds, because I think that the topic that I will be speaking on is a lot closer to the topic of this conference. And when I was giving the abstract, I wasn't aware of this fact. Uh, so when I, I, I wasn't aware of the fact that what I'm speaking about today is really uh, related so much with the sort of Higgs bundles and Anosov representations and uh, other sorts of objects. But you might be wondering what is this object that's spinning around on the screen. So this is what the abstract was about. So this is an integral affine sphere. So it's a, it's a certain kind of structure, geometric structure on a sphere with singularities. And uh, these objects turn out to have an interesting moduli space and interesting dynamics. The points that you can see on the sphere are orbits of an interesting dynamical system. So I say interesting because it's not like the Sudanos of mappings that many people here are used to. There is a lot of periodic behavior, you can see that there are empty spots on the surface and so on and so forth. But this is a subject that, although I think is very interesting, uh, I will leave for a different time. So uh, wh what will I be speaking about? It's a list of different topics that uh, somehow seem to converge in an inter int interesting way. So I started thinking about Lapunov exponents and the uh, variations of Hodge structures. And uh, in particular, in the setting of in the sort of very classical setting of hypergeometric equations and sort of 19th century ODEs, but uh, somehow this uh, led into uh, not just discrete subgroups of Lie groups, but also specifically something that's very much related to Anosov representations. So uh, I'll, I'll begin by stating the main theorem, and uh, the way I'm going to state it is going to be funny, and I I, I like this statement because it's it's not very often that you can state a theorem in three lines and it's clear to a calculus student. So, so here, here's the first line. So you, de you define uh, two functions. So psi zero is that power series. Uh, sum, uh, the summation on both power series should go from zero to infinity. I apologize for that. So psi zero is that power series. Psi one is the same kind of beast as psi zero, but it has also this log t term. That's two explicit power series. Uh, they have some radius of convergence. So now uh, we can consider something that's called the Ronskian or the Ronsky determinant. So you just take that expression. It's the determinant of a matrix, two by two matrix, whose columns are the function and its derivative. So psi zero, psi zero prime. Okay, so this is uh, the first half of the second line. So the second half of the second line is to consider another function. So here it is. Uh, a power series now in a, in a different variable Q. So again, unambiguously defined objects. So now the, the theorem is the following. So the theorem is that this expression, so if you compose the Ronskian with the function lambda, uh, it never vanishes for absolute value of Q less than one. So that's uh, a statement about power series and holomorphic functions, so in fact the variables, both variables q and t can take holomorphic, uh, can take complex values. And you might be wondering what can this have to do with Anosov representations or geometric structures or anything of that sort. So uh, to, to try to give you a hint that this is not completely unrelated to geometry, so I cannot first ask what kind of function is lambda? So I saw at least some people smiling, so does anybody, who, who knows? So I, I should say that uh, this formulation of the theorem is from uh, uh, a paper of Eskin, Konsevich, Moller, and Zorich. So uh, I'll, I'll state an equivalent version, which is not understandable to a calculus student, but hopefully understandable to this audience. Uh, so, uh, so what's the function lambda? What, what does it do? What, so it takes values, so it comes really from the punctured unit disk into, uh, the Riemann sphere minus zero, one, and infinity, and it's just the uniformization of this. Uh, so it, it, it gives you the hyperbolic metric on the Riemann sphere minus three points. So how so? Well, you, you have to take a map from the upper half plane 
So here, if you have a variable tau, you take q to be e to the 2 pi i tau. Sorry, should I write bigger or? Yeah, OK, let me just rewrite this. So q is e to the 2 pi i tau. And lambda is just the uniformization from this coordinate q, from the puncture disk, unit disk, to uh, the Riemann sphere minus three points. So uh, this is what, is la what lambda is. So it's a kind of classical object. And uh, in particular, so uh, you know, uh, th th this is what it is. So now what are the functions psi zero and psi one? So maybe I'll just talk mostly about psi zero. So psi zero is an example of a hypergeometric function. So this function satisfies a differential equation, which I'll eventually write down. But it also satisfies a bunch of other interesting properties. And it's related to local systems and representations and uh, m many uh, things that are the subject of this conference. So, uh, so now at least some of the objects maybe are related to uh, other concepts that you, uh, you, people are more familiar with. So now I'd like to say the, an equivalent form of this uh, theorem. So this, uh, an equivalent form due to, uh, so this is actually the question that I was interested in initially. So uh, one has an equality, a formula, an equality between two numbers, lambda one and lambda two, which are Lapinov exponents and which are really coming from dynamics and two topological invariants, mu one and mu two, and uh, these are mu one and mu two are some explicit rational numbers. In this particular case, for these particular functions, they're one fifth and two fifths. Whereas lambda one and lambda two are probably some, not probably transcendental, but there's no reason to believe that they have any other kind of structure. There's just some numbers. Their sum turns out to be this rational number. And uh, I, I, will, I will try to explain how this is related to uh, some amount of geometry. So uh, to, to proceed, I have to introduce uh, Lapinov exponents and uh, try to explain a little bit wh what is their geometric significance. So, oh, I should say that, uh, let, me just, let me just go back. There are at least six more examples of such explicit theorems. And uh, in fact, th th there could be some open sets of parameters for which these kinds of statements are true. But I, I would like to just focus for the purpose of this presentation on this particular example. And I'll try to uh, describe the broader context in which uh, such things are true. OK, so what are uh, Lapinov exponents? So uh, consider a hyperbolic surface, which I'll denote sigma. And GT will be the geodesic flow on the unit tangent bundle of this uh, surface. So now. Uh, this is the first building block. And the second building block is a representation. So you take the fundamental group of the surface and you map it to some space of matrices. So you have a, a collection of matrices. So this gives you a local system V rho or equivalent to a vector bundle uh, with a flat connection. So you can think of this in many different ways depending on how you prefer. But at each point over the Riemann surface, you have a vector space. And locally, these vector spaces are identified in a canonical way. But if you go around the loop on your surface, then you come back with a different identification. And this identification is exactly given by the representation rho. So you have a, a vector bundle with a flat connection. This is what this v rho is supposed to denote. All right. So uh, what, what can you do uh, with these two objects if you put them together? So you can compute the Lapinov exponent. So the first Lapinov exponent is the following. You take, so I, I should mention that I'm making some standard assumptions like irreducibility of this representation and so on and so forth. So you take some non-zero vector v and you uh, uh, start moving it along a typical geodesic. So uh, this is what gt applied to v means. I mean, let, me, let me just draw a picture. You have your surface. And so here's your, some starting point. It doesn't really matter where you start. This is a fiber of v rho. And you pick a vector, v. And you start moving it so, ar along a random geodesic. So this geodesic starts going around the surface. And it starts moving around. And 
as you're moving around this, uh, along this geodesic, you are applying matrices in your represent, from your representation row. So if your geodesic has come back close to where it started, you really can produce a matrix that corresponds to that element of the fundamental group. And uh, what general theory of dynamical systems tells you is that there's some number, lambda one, such that for a typical vector and for a typical geodesic, if you go along in that direction, your vector will grow at an exponential rate, e to the t, and the rate is given by this number, lambda one. So this is a number that you can produce dynamically and which uh, I should point out that it, it exists by some kind of abstract reason. Typically, it's, it's not possible to compute them. So you can, I said exponents, not just one exponent. So to get other exponents, you take an exterior power of your representation. So you take uh, what I denoted lambda to the power i of rho, and then a typical vector will grow at a rate which is given by that formula. So you define the ith Lapinov exponent to be uh, the number that you put into that summation to get the, uh, the growth rate. So you get these uh, n numbers. They could be, some of them could be equal. So lambda one is bigger than or equal to lambda two and so on up to lambda n. They could all be zero. So for example, if your image is in a compact subgroup of GLN, then your vector is never going to grow. So if you preserve some norm, every time you apply a matrix, you're not changing the norm. So it could be that all these numbers are zero. So your vector isn't really growing, but that's not the situation we'll be interested in in this talk. Okay, so this is uh, w what uh, Lapinov exponents are. So w w what is a typical source of uh, representations of uh, the fundamental group or a fundamental group into uh, the matrix space? So uh, may maybe, uh, well, before I get to the representations, let, let me just uh, mention what, uh, what is Hodge theory. So if you have any algebraic variety, any submanifold of projective space that you cut out by polynomial equations, its cohomology, its, H, you know, some, its cohomology groups have an extra structure. So they have this extra decomposition uh, into PQ components. So you can think of uh, the PQ subspace in cohomology as the subspace that corresponds to the to forms of type PQ. So you have locally coordinates DZI and uh, DZI bar, and so HPQ corresponds to differential forms that have P DZIs and Q DZI bars. So, so you have this extra structure on an uh, algebraic variety. Uh, now, if you have a family, then you get a representation like the one uh, that I was speaking about earlier. So whenever you have some family of manifolds, you have uh, a representation like this into uh, the cohomology of uh, the, the, your manifolds. So the, the GL, so there should be no N under the GL. So it's just the general linear group of the cohomology of your manifold. So if in this picture you replace your fiber by, by a so if you replace the fiber by some manifold, so maybe the simplest example is another surface, then locally, of course, the topology, so I assume that you have a smooth family, so locally, the surfaces are topologically equivalent. So locally, you, can, you have a natural identification between the, say, integral cohomologies of two nearby surfaces. So you have a surface here, and you have another surface that sits on top of this point. Locally, there's a, an identification. And however, if you go around the loop, then you might accumulate some uh, monodromy. So you have to take care of, of this by specifying a representation from the fundamental group of your surface into the cohomology groups of this, uh, of, 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 your man, of, of your fiber manifold. So may, maybe the simplest example is if you have uh, the upper half plane and you take the quotient by some subgroup of SLNZ, then you, you'll get a family of uh, elliptic curves that s sits over such a thing. Uh, elliptic curves also being another word for just two-dimensional real tori. So now you can ask how do these two uh, invariants interact? So uh, you have the Lapinov exponents, which are a dynamical concept, and then you have these uh, representations that come naturally from algebraic geometry. And you also have, uh, so I should say that 
a row does not preserve the decomposition into PQ components. So that is a differential geometric uh, object, and it, it really does not vary. So if you know the Hodge decomposition on one surface, if you move to a nearby surface, there's no reason why you should know how the new Hodge decomposition looks like. However, there are some uh, properties of, that these objects satisfy. So I'm, I'm not going to make them explicit. OK, so how, how do these uh, two invariants interact? So uh, the, the simplest case you can consider, and somehow historically this is where it started, is when you have, uh, you're in weight one. So this means that, for example, you have a family of Riemann surfaces. So then your cohomology has just two components. You're interested in the first cohomology group of a Riemann surface. So you know that's 2G dimensional, where G is the genus. But there is a G dimensional subspace co corresponding to holomorphic one forms and a complex conjugate corresponding to complex conjugate holomorphic one forms. And uh, so the name, uh, the order I wrote the names in is so that, so it started with some, uh, the, the whole story started with some numerical experiments that Anton Zorich performed. Uh, and so he, uh, he discovered some uh, surprising facts. So I'll say it in a moment. So suppose you have a family of Riemann sur surfaces. You have these G exponents. So the dimension of the space is 2G. So in principle, you have 2G exponents. But because the, there's a symplectic pairing on the cohomology of a Riemann surface, there's a symmetry of that sort. So you have that whenever you have one Lapinov exponent, its negative also has to occur. So really, you have only G interesting numbers. Uh, so what Anton uh, Zorich discovered experimentally was that, in fact, the sum of these uh, first, uh, the positive exponents is a rational number. So he was running computer experiments. It's quite reasonable to simulate these things on a computer, as I'll uh, try to explain a little bit later. But uh, what he discovered was that it was a rational number. And then Konsevich gave a, an explanation for this formula. And then Forney developed this uh, a lot further. But the basic shape of the formula is something of this uh, type. So you have a degree of some vector bundle, in this case, h10. And chi is the Euler characteristic of, uh, of the base manifold. OK. So this is uh, in weight one. Then in weight two, uh, you have now, so you have three spaces like this. Uh, two zero could be, the sp H two zero space could be d-dimensional. The H one one space is k-dimensional. And zero two has to satisfy the symmetry. So then in this case, you have a formula of very similar shape as the one previous, uh, as the previous formula. So the sum of the first d exponents, where d is the dimension of, uh, H to zero, you have, again, uh, you know, it's, it's equal to the ratio of two d a degree and uh, another characteristic. So uh, when d is one, I, I proved this. And then uh, for all d, uh, independently, Matteo Constantini and I observed that th the same thing holds. So the, the interesting part, in some sense, happens in weight three. So uh, for, for weight three, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, again, simplest example, which is the example that I started the talk with. So I'll assume that the Hodge numbers are just 1, 1, 1, and 1. So uh, topologically, the representation here is going to be into, so rho is going to be from pi 1 of sigma to the symplectic uh, group on a four-dimensional real vector space. So uh, in this case, the situation is, uh, uh, the following. So essentially, by the same methods as in previous uh, works, what you can show, so Eskin, Konsevich, Moller, and Zorich prove the following general inequality, uh, which is that the first two exponents, lambda 1 and lambda 2, are bigger than some quantity, uh, rational quantity on the, si on the right-hand side. So I wrote it uh, in, in that way. So. Uh, I, I, so the, the, the nature of this inequality is, is quite general. And I should mention that for, for people who think, for example, uh, of things like Milner-Wood inequalities, this inequality is of the opposite type. So a Milner-Wood inequality is morally an upper bound on uh, Lapinov exponents. And here, you really have a lower bound. And uh, so you, you have a lower bound of this sort, which is really kind of a general phenomenon. And uh, so. The, the story became uh, interesting. So when a few years ago, so Maxim, Maxim Konsevich f first made the, a series of numerical experiments on uh, what are 
in the physics literature known as, uh, so, so there are these 14 families of, uh, so there's a representation like this which is parameterized really by two parameters, mu1 and mu2. And for 14 values of these parameters, 14 of these values, you can arrange for this representation to land after conjugation, you can arrange for it to land in the integral cohomology. So when you have 14, you have 14 families such that rho goes from by one of, so now in fact it's a concrete surface is the sphere minus three points and you can arrange for this to land in the integral cohomology of, of some relevant family. So th these 14 families are, uh, have been studied a lot in connection with sort of mirror symmetry but also uh, number theory and uh, a, a host of different subjects. I'll, I'll try to uh, mention some of them. But uh, what Konsevich did first was he plugged in uh, these, this monodromy into uh, the computer and uh, tried to, sim so he plugged in these representations, simulated the Lapinov exponents and discovered the following thing that for seven of these uh, cases, so let me, yeah, so th this is the representation. So for seven of these cases, you have the equality in this formula. So the, the black dots uh, were the equality hold, held and for the green dots, uh, the inequality was strict. So it was natural to conjecture that, uh, well, I don't know how natural it was, but in any case, it was hypothesized that it, it's always true whenever, so you have that blue line, so it's always, that formula should always be true for parameters mu1 and mu2 which are above that line. And uh, then Charles Fougeron uh, performed much more extensive numerical experiments and this is the kind of graph that he produced where you see, so the blue parameters are where uh, it's reasonable, there's reasonable numerical evidence to suspect that uh, the, the formula holds as it is and for the red parameters it's definitely false. And uh, I should say that, uh, so if you look on the, this critical blue line, he did sort of even more accurate experiments and in fact, it seems like there is an infinite collection of points on which, at which the formula holds, but really it should be a discrete set. Yeah? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, all of them are geometric. Yeah, so they cannot have, they're not integral monodromy. So some of them can have, for example, monodromy in some algebraic number field, but not, uh, you, you cannot really conjugate it to have integer matrices. Yeah? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to, there will be matrices on the next slide, like very, very explicit matrices on the next slide. Uh, in fact, the, the monodromy, so the, the monodromy, so in this, in this family, uh, which, which depends on these uh, two parameters, mu1 and mu2, the monodromy is uh, very explicit. In fact, the, the reason why the parameters were chosen like this was, maybe I, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the monodromy has, you know, by some kind of physics requirements, it had to be of some particular unipotent shape. It had to satisfy certain conditions. And uh, so this is how these white was cut down. In fact, there's a much larger family that one can consider, but it was cut down to just two parameters by some uh, conditions that come from physics or string theory. Uh, okay, so, so, so what, what, what are these? Uh, so, so, so this was just a numerical experiment. Seven families, seven members of the family, the formula is true. Seven members, the form, form, formula seems to be a strict inequality. So, uh, yeah, so this I said it's integral. So in fact, th there's another uh, dichotomy which at the time was uh, conjectural, but then people figured it out. So seven of these uh, uh, members of the seven of these cases are arithmetic groups. So this means that the image of this uh, representation is, in fact, a finite index subgroup of, subgroup of the symplectic group. And in the other seven cases, they're what are called. Uh, Thin, thin subgroups, meaning that they're infinite index inside the symplectic group. And uh, what was seen numerically was that for the arithmetic cases, the inequality was always strict, and for the thin cases, the inequality seemed to be 
uh, an equality. So th there seemed to be a formula for these, uh, at least numerically. So uh, for the strict inequality, uh, in the arithmetic case, so there's a, a proof by uh, Daniel and uh, Jeremy Daniel and Bertrand Deron. And but, so th their proof really is kind of stated for the compact case. So it, it doesn't kind of directly apply to, to this family, but somehow uh, once they, they'll fix some, overcome some uh, technical details, there will, be, there will be a proof uh, which, which is quite conceptual of, of why this inequality should be strict in the thin case, in, in the arithmetic case. And I also have a proof w which applies in this setting, and it's kind of a hands-on proof, uh, just kind of with matrices, uh, using some pr basic properties of matrices. But what I really want to th focus on is the thin cases, which, because this is where I think the interesting uh, stuff is happening, and where there, there are connections with, uh, as I said, of representations and geometric structures. Okay, so. Yeah, so the, the, exactly. So this is a, a, the group on the left is a free group on two letters. So if it surjects onto a lattice in SP4, then it's, it has a big kernel. Uh, so in the thin case, modulo some obvious relations, uh, it's injective. And I'll get to that in, uh, in, in a moment. This will be, in fact, th there's a good understanding of what's going on, and I'll try to say it. Okay, so, uh, so these families that I, uh, uh, that these parameters, mu1 and mu2, they really parameterize what are called hypergeometric equations. So this is a topic that started many hundreds of years ago. And so this is the simplest hypergeometric equation uh, so th th there it is, it's, it, it's a formula, it's an explicit formula which you can solve. It's uh, what's called a differential, uh, ordinary differential equation with regular singularities at zero, one, and infinity. And uh, th th there it is. There's an explicit uh, solution for a, major, for a function n near the origin. So the, uh, a solution, to, uh, so there's a holomorphic solution near the origin so this is uh, roughly how, it, how a power series for such a solution looks like. And so the notation here is that An denotes A times A plus 1, dot, 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 A plus N minus 1. So this is a kind of power series like the one you saw in the, on the first slide. However, the one that was on the first slide is, uh, it refers to a hypergeometric function of slightly higher order. So anyway, this is, a, this is a function. It has a power series representation. It has an integral representation. And the reason why it has an integral representation is in fact related in a way with uh, the fact that this uh, differential equation is, gives you what's called a rigid local system. So how do you get a local system or a representation from uh, a differential equation? So let me try to explain because in some sense, the subject of discrete subgroups and uh, representations of surface groups into uh, Lie groups really kind of comes from th these kinds of examples. So, so our differential equation has a singularity here at zero, at one, and at infinity. And so if you start, so you start with a little chart, let's say here, so this is U and you solve your differential equation in power series. So first, what do I mean by singularities? By singularities, I mean that if you try to write out a power series solution for uh, the function f at the point zero, one, and infinity, you'll have some trouble solving the power series. Uh, however, if you're away from these three points in any small neighborhood, you can explicitly solve uh, the equation there, there's, a formal, there's a solution, it converges, and then you can go around the loop in, uh, in your manifold, uh, in, in your base space, in this case, the, the, the plane, the complex plane. And if you go around the loop and you analytically continue the solution, when you come back, you're gonna get a different solution. The function is not going to be single value. So maybe the simplest example is if you have, uh, let's see, so f prime, uh, sorry, z times f prime equals one. So if you have an equation like this, uh, the logarithm solves this uh, equation, and 
log z is, is a solution. However, if you go around the loop, log z will accumulate a term of 2 pi i. So you, you'll, get a, uh, you'll, you'll get monodromy. And in fact, you have, uh, if your equation is of degree n, then uh, you have, uh, locally you have n solutions. If you move all of them around a loop, you come back with a new basis of solutions and you get a matrix from the new solutions to the old, from the old solutions to the new solutions. So this is uh, how you get monodromy matrices. So you get a linear representation from a differential equation. And so subject to certain conditions, this, uh, this hypergeometric equation is essentially unique. So once you impose some reasonable geometric constraints, it turns out that there's a unique such differential equation. This is why, in some sense, hypergeometric equations appear very often and uh, are useful. And once you have this kind of uniqueness, which is called rigidity in, in this theory of differential equations or local systems, it gives you what's called the rigid local systems system. And by Simpson's correspondence, it gives you a variation of Hodge structures on the associated local system. OK. So this is all, uh, the, the subject has kind of this mixture of abstract results and concrete examples. And one way in which, for example, this differential equation was first studied was using the uh, reflection principle. So if you have a function f which solves such an equation, what Schwartz proved is that if you look in the upper half plane, then uh, you have a mapping. And in fact, the function, the solution f will map the upper half plane into a triangle with vertices f of 0, f of 1, and f of infinity. And to compute the solution on the other triangle, you just have to do a, a reflection. So you have to do a complex conjugation and, uh, and a respective automorphism of the, of the plane. And so uh, this way, for example, Schwartz was able to study geometrically the monodromy of this uh, differential equation. And he, uh, for example, computed the, w w what are the cases when F has finite monodromy. So for what values of A, B, and C, is it true that there's, there are solutions such that the, uh, you know, there's a finite basis of solutions that, that, that are all algebraic functions, essentially. OK, so this is uh, the hypergeometric equation of degree 2. For the discussion in, in these 14 families, we need a hypergeometric equation of degree 4. But one can also define it for uh, just dz, uh, so, sorry, for, for, for degree n. And so it's easiest to write it in terms of the operator capital D, which is th that thing over there. And then there's this explicit formula for the, uh, f f for the equation. So uh, what is uh, important for us, so the parameters, so the beta parameters have to be all set equal to 0. And this is uh, because we have the requirement of maximal unipotent monodromy. So mom means maximal unipotent monodromy, and this means the following. This means that at 0, so, so we have maximal So this means that your monodromy matrix, I think it's u. This is monodromy at 0. So maximal, uh, so it's a 4 by 4 matrix. And uh, maximal unipotent means that it's unipotent. And it's such that if you subtract, so what does it mean to be unipotent? It means that if you subtract the identity, it's nilpotent. So you have, raise it to some power, it becomes 0. So that power has to be as large as possible. Geometrically, this means that there exists a line L inside R4 and the plane capital L, which uh, is also in R4, and L is contained in, little l is contained in capital L, and U preserves this filtration, preserves little l and capital L. And moreover, because the monodromy is symplectic in this case, it also preserves uh, the orthogonal complement the symplectic orthogonal of L. So you have this uh, special condition at 0, which is actually going to play a role in, um, in, the, in, in our discussion. And then the other two parameters are mu1 and mu2. And then you have you required that symmetry. So uh, 
th this is why you have this two parameter family which depends on mu1 and mu2. L is a Lagrangian, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. L is a Lagrangian subspace, exactly. Yeah? No. Yeah. Yeah, so little l and capital L are unique. They're, they're, yes, they're, they're preserved, but in particular, so what I, that's not the definition of maximal unipotent, but that's a property of maximal unipotent. Okay. So the example that I began with is what's called the mirror quintic. So it corresponds to parameter values. Uh, mu1 is one fifth and mu2 is two fifths. And so it corresponds to a very explicit family of uh, manifolds. Uh, strictly speaking, so you, you take that equation. T is your parameter. So up there, T is, in the, is a complex number. And anywhere away from 0, 1, and infinity, this is going to be a smooth projective threefold inside four, uh, projective, complex projective four space. There's a lot of symmetry. As you can see, there's a lot of Z mod fives that can act on the coordinates. And uh, once you impose, uh, you quotient by some symmetries, you, you, you play a little, do a little dance, and eventually you're left with uh, just a four-dimensional interesting part of cohomology. So there's, there's a lot of, the, the, the thing I wrote over there has a lot of cohomology. This representation that you get for mu1 and mu2 equal to one-fifth and two-fifths is something that is the interesting part once you account for the relevant symmetries. And the functions that I wrote, psi zero and psi one, up to some normalization, they're just integrals of a holomorphic three form over a three cycle inside this uh, manifold. So it's a period in, in this sort of classical sense. So this is where the functions come from. OK, so, so now explicit matrices. What, how, what, what, what are these uh, uh, groups? So I should say that. The, the, the way uh, the, the story goes with these 14 families was that uh, first four of them were shown to be arithmetic by uh, some combination of authors. So the people who worked on arithmeticity were Singh and Venkataramana, and they showed first four of them arithmetic, then another three, and then Brav and Thomas in one uh, with, with, with the same technique, they showed that the other seven uh, families are th thin subgroups, so they're infinite index. So how did they show this? So I'll focus just on the, for the, the, the concrete example that uh, I've been talking about. So here are two matrices, T and R. So T is uh, the monodromy at uh, one, and R is at infinity. So the notation is not mine, uh, but unfortunately I had to follow it. Uh, otherwise, it's very confusing. Every paper has different notations, and I, I tried to fix one uh, and not introduce an extra one. So. Uh, T is the monodromy at around one. So let me just write this here. So I have zero, one is infinity. And then T is around here. Uh, R is at infinity. And U is at zero. And th there's a correct choice of uh, direction in which you have to go, but uh, I will not specify it. So th these are two, two explicit matrices. And what Brav and Thomas show is that there are two cones, C plus and C minus. They're invariant by T. So well, if you apply T to C plus, T, so C plus is the attracting cone for T. C minus is the repelling cone for T. So it's the attracting for T minus. So using a standard ping pong argument, you can check that gamma is splits as a free product of a free group generated by T. And R, R turns out to be a finite order matrix in this case, and you can just check by ping pong that uh, you get a finite, uh, uh, sorry, you get a free product of this type. So to address your question, the map is not exactly injective, the representation, but it's injective up to what's expected. So it, it was expected for this matrix R to be finite order. So uh, it's, that, that, that's what it is. Okay, so let me uh, show you a picture of how this, these cones look like. So the blue cones are C plus and C minus. And uh, so this is a picture in projective uh, three space in a chart in R3. And then you have these cones C plus and C minus, which are the blue cones. And the way T acts is just by translation by plus one or minus one, depending on if you take T or T inverse. So the chart is chosen in such a way that T 
which is just that translation, uh, uh, tx by just uh, one, uh, adding one or subtracting one from the coordinate, let me know that t is unipotent but not maximally unipotent. So t, uh, if you subtract the identity matrix from t, if you raise it, if you square the result, you already get zero. And uh, u does not have this property. I didn't write down u explicitly because it's, uh, it's a little bit of a bigger matrix. Okay, so these are the two cones, C plus and C minus. Now, if you apply R five times to these cones, you get 10 cones that became very, very small and connect these other two cones. And uh, if you apply T again and come back, you get, uh, so you map those cones inside. And so you get a nice limit set this way. Uh, yeah? Oh, uh, maybe, for, actually for the next picture, I'll need one. That's okay, no, no problem. No. Oh, thanks. Uh, in any case, so uh, using this ping pong, you can actually uh, fairly concretely understand the limit set. Uh, now, w w what's interesting, so th th this is one part which I'm not sure about because I, uh, I'm not sure, I, I don't know, so the literature on hypergeometric functions is huge, and I know, th so there's a classical computation of the monodromy, which is due to leveled, but it turns out that in this case, there's also a reflection. Uh, so the matrices, uh, the monodromy matrices, in fact, factorize as a product of three different reflections. So you have uh, the same kind of picture as in the Schwartz uh, reflection principle. So you have, uh, so if you think of this as the uniformization of zero, one, at, and uh, infinity. So let me, so you have zero, one, infinity. And then you have here the matrices a, B, and C, then in fact you can factorize the monodromy representation uh, the way it's written over there. T is the product of two reflections B and A, R is the product of the other two reflections B and C. Uh, the matrices are up there, you can just check them. I didn't find, I, I never saw this in the literature, but it could have been known in the 19th century. So uh, the, the picture over there is, uh, kind of a, a, a scheme of what these uh, transformations are doing. So each of these transformations is a reflection in, a, a Lagra in a decomposition into Lagrangians. So what you do is you write R4 as L1 plus L2, and L1 and L2 are Lagrangians, and the reflection matrix acts as the identity on one and as minus one on the other Lagrangian. And uh, what, what you see in this, picture are the Lagrangian subspaces in which you're doing these reflections. And so uh, I have the colors here. So A is a reflection in the red. Uh, so there are two red lines. Actually, uh, there's one red line and there's a yellow line, which is both red and green. So A and B actually turn out to share a reflecting Lagrangian. And uh, the blue lines correspond to reflections in C. And uh, so you, you have this kind of very funny looking configuration which satisfies a lot of uh, collineation properties. Uh, you can also see that in dark red is the maximal unipotent Lagrangian. Nobody, none of the reflections is reflecting in that Lagrangian, but it's, it's kind of an important, important uh, Lagrangian. And the plane that you can see is the plane that is at infinity in the previous chart. Okay, so that, uh, that's uh, thin groups. That, this is why the group is thin and there's an explicit re realization. And there's also a geometric understanding uh, that's very analogous to the Schwarz, to the Schwarz reflection. Okay, so uh, this is where we're starting to make contact with Anosov representations. So I, uh, as I said, when I started working on this, I didn't realize that this is at all related to, uh, to these concepts, but uh, it, it, it turns out that it is and so, there are many people who have uh, worked on, on, the, on the subject. I apologize if I'm not completely familiar with the literature. But uh, so in this context, the, the, the following things are true. So you have a limit set, which is I'll denote by lambda gamma, which sits in this project, projectivized uh, R4. So it sits in dimension three. It's just the intersection of iterations of those cones that I draw earlier. Okay, so you have such a limit set. And then uh, what can you do? So you can do, uh, the, the interesting action is actually happening on the Lagrangian Grassmannian, not on the uh, projectization of R4. 
So you have the following saturated limit set, uh, which is what? Uh, you look at the limit set, lambda gamma, and for each point in lambda gamma, for each line in lambda gamma, you consider all the Lagrangians in R4, which contain that little line L. So this, uh, the Lagrangian Grassmannian is three-dimensional, uh, real Lagrangian Grassmannian of R4 is three-dimensional, and so you get, for each point in the limit set, you get a line, which I think, if you, if you look at it from the point of view of Lorentzian geometry, people call a photon. So it's, it's, a, it's a line that goes around this Grassmannian once. So the topology of this Grassmannian is roughly S1 times S2. So if, if you want a schematic picture, you have S1 times S2, approximately, uh, up to some finite index. And so the, these, uh, these, uh, so for each point in the uh, limit set, you associate a, a straight line. So now you can consider the domain of discontinuity, which is going to be the complement of, uh, of this limit set, uh, of the saturated limit set. And then uh, what's going to be true is that gamma is going to act properly discontinuously. So uh, I think most of the time the literature on analysis of representations is concerned with, concerned with purely loxodromic elements when you have a free, for example, if you have a free group on two elements, you act by, say, two hyperbolic elements. Here, the same kind of techniques will uh, apply. And however, you have unipotent, you have lots of unipotents. So I don't know if this, to what extent, I'm, I'm sure that people have studied this in the literature, maybe this has a name, but one could say that this representation is log Anosov. I, I don't know if that's a, a real name or, Anyway, uh, the reason for, for log is, for, at least for, for me, there are two reasons. One is that there are many, so th there are conditions about divergence of singular values, and uh, in the Anasov case, you oftentimes have linear divergence. Here, because of unipotence, you only have log divergence. And also because in algebraic geometry, when you take away some punctures, put in some punctures, you call that a log something. So any, in any case, a lot of this technology extends to, uh, to this particular case, Oh, uh, and, and, and you can prove that you have this proper discontinuity. Yeah? yeah? Are you talking about generals? No, no. Uh, no, no. So I'm, I'm working, I, I'm making the claim only about the gamma that I wrote on the previous slide. Those two matrices. Uh, in fact, any seven of those matrices. Uh, any seven of those families. Okay. So how does this connect to Hodge theory? Uh, so this is, uh, so we have to go back to and somehow connect this to Hodge theory. So uh, you have the Hodge decomposition. So the interesting part is what's called, uh, the, there's a, usually people don't work with the Hodge decomposition, but it's more convenient to work with the Hodge filtration. So F2 is the second element of this filtration. It's a Lagrangian subspace. Uh, wh 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 what's, what are the bad Lagrangians for F2? So uh, to each such, element F2, you can associate a real, uh, a the, you consider the collection of all real Lagrangians, uh, which satisfy this property that when you complexify them, they intersect uh, this element F2. So this is just a definition. Uh, what's, if you want to think about it in terms of, the, of this picture, so the limit set elements are what are called, what I was saying, they're photons, they look something like this. So they, th there's a causal structure and, uh, on this Lagrangian Grassmannian, and the uh, elements of the limit set are really kind of going uh, the light rays like this, whereas the object that I have up there, this bad of F2, this is just a, a trajectory which is kind of time-like, or, you know, the, uh, it, it goes this way. So th there's a light cone, and the photons have to lie on the light cone always, whereas the, these bad Lagrangians, they always have to be, it's, it's a li line that moves uh, like this. So this is the bad set associated to, uh, the, uh, to a complex Lagrangian like F2. So now you can consider the bad bundle, which is just a bundle of, so I should say that bad of F2 is a circle, so now you have a circle bond, bundle over your thrice punctured sphere. So what is the fiber over a point is just the fiber associated to that element of the Hodge decomposition. Okay. So uh, now the, 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 key, the key theorem is that 
the ba this bundle of bad Lagrangians can be identified with the quotient we had previously. So remember, uh, L omega gamma was the domain of discontinuity. If you take the quotient by the group, you get uh, what I said is the circle bundle. And so what was interesting to me is that I, I kind of worked my way backwards from what should be true if that formula held. And then I discovered that uh, this was in, in a similar setting, not in, in com assuming compact uh, curves and things of this sort, uh, it, it was essentially done by Collier, Tolzan, and Toulouse. So it's, and I think tomorrow or on Friday, somebody will be speaking about uh, exactly this work. So, uh, so it turns out that somehow uh, you, you have this nice identification from the point of view of Hodge theory of, uh, of, of these uh, bundles. And how is it relevant to the uh, question uh, I, I began with? The, the key point is that the maximal unipode in Lagrangian is never bad. So this uh, Lagrangian that we had in the beginning that was guaranteed by essentially the construction, so it's never going to be a bad Lagrangian. Why is it so? Because the maximal unipotent Lagrangian is in the limit set, so it's never hit by the uh, by the bundle of bad Lagrangians. So, so you have this uh, this property that you, you, first of all you have a natural, a nice uniformization of this circle bundle over the surface, but you also have uh, a, a geometric property, namely that you're not hitting certain Lagrangians that you don't want to hit. So in particular, the function that I had on the first slide never, never vanishes. So that, that function, if you work out everything very explicitly, it's, it's possible to do so, you see that this is just a Plucker coordinate and it really is measuring whether the F2 is intersecting that particular uh, unipo maximally, maximally unipotent Lagrangian. So uh, this never happens and that's why the function never vanishes. So this is, so the explanation for why that equality holds in the seven thin cases is essentially because there's a geometric structure on uh, the, on a circle bundle over the surface and that geometric structure can be realized as a quotient of some open set in some uh, Lagrangian Grassmannian. Okay, so this is, uh, th this explains what, uh, what I said on the first slide, what, 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 what more is true, again, with the technology of Anosov representations? So uh, if you look at the group uh, SP, uh, so set G to be, again, the real symplectic group, uh, you take H to be the unitary 1-1 one, one subgroup, so it's a non-compact subgroup, and uh, w what you can show, again, in this case, is just a concrete check that uh, gamma acts on G mod H properly discontinuously. And this is a non-trivial statement exactly because H is a non-compact subgroup. And uh, the way to check it is by uh, applying a criterion due to uh, Yves Benoit. And again, uh, some form of these kinds of statements was established also by Gerita, Gishar, Cassel, Wienhard, and I think uh, there are probably many other names that I don't know because of the, my poor knowledge of the literature. But uh, I, I should uh, say at this point that the, uh, I, uh, I was talking to Peter Sarnak about the, the, this question of thin subgroups. So thin subgroups is something that people in kind of analytic number theory are interested in uh, to some extent. And uh, he, he told me about some numerical experiments that people performed uh, that indicated that essentially eigenvalues of elements in gamma should be of a particular shape. You, can, you never see double eigenvalues essentially. And uh, th this, is, th this led me to uh, with Benoit's criterion to, to realize that this statement should be true and should be directly checkable. And then I looked at the literature on Anosov representations and I saw that these kinds of statements are actually what people uh, prove there. Uh, okay, so, uh, so wh 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 why is this potentially interesting? Well, G mod H is not uh, any homogeneous space. It's again a Lagrangian Grassmannian, but it's the Lagrangian and Grassmannian that parameterizes our F2s in the Hodge filtration. So I, I wrote the axioms there. So F2 has to satisfy, it's a Lagrangian subspace of complex four dimensional space satisfying this property that F2 and its complex conjugate give a direct sum decomposition. And the signature of the Hermitian pairing on F2 should be uh, 1, 1. 
So this is a geometric description. The key point is that uh, this Lagrangian Grassmannian with signature 1, 1 is a complex manifold. It's a complex threefold. So uh, you get that if you take the uh, left and right quotient, uh, you get a complex three-dimensional manifold, Y gamma, which before this, there's no reason to expect that such a thing exists. So uh, before one has in hand uh, the cones and the certificate that the action is properly discontinuous, uh, so you, you get essentially out of nowhere a, a complex three-dimensional manifold, and it has two very funny properties. The first one is the following. Uh, so again, you can consider, uh, you, you look again at uh, the maximal unipole in Lagrangian L, and you consider the F2s which are bad for this uh, Lagrangian. So let, let me remind you what, what it means to be bad. So bad is when F2 intersected with a complexification is not zero. So when they're, when they're in non-transverse position. So if you consider the subset BL, which is bad, bad F2s for this maximum polar Lagrangian, so this is a co-dimension one sub-manifold, so it's a surface inside this complex threefold, and you can project it. I'm not exactly sure what happens when you project it, but you also have an assignment from the surface, so you map a point on the surface to the associated F2, and you know that these two things are disjoint. So you have a three-dimensional three manifold and complex three manifold, and inside you have a surface and another curve, and they're disjoint. And so it could be that BL is kind of winding around a lot, and its closure is maybe not necessarily a, a nice submanifold, although I think it has a very good chance to be a good submanifold because it's disjoint from this other curve. Uh, and I think it would be very interesting to uh, understand what's actually going on with this, uh, with this configuration. In particular, is Y gamma, uh, you know, is there a, compl a complex compactification of it? So I think the general theory of, uh, developed by Gary Tagishar and Cassell and Vinhard and other people should tell you that uh, there's a real compactification. There's a way to attach some real points on the boundary to make this compact. But if there would be a complex compactification, something that makes the comp compactified object a complex manifold, it would be a very interesting complex manifold to look at because it has inside the complex two-dimensional sub-manifold, uh, sub so surface, which is, uh, you know, it's a divisor, so one can ask whether there's some algebraic structure to this. Okay, so uh, w w what are the conclusions that uh, I, I want to draw? So. The first thing is that in Hodge theory, it's possible to make Higgs bundles and their representations explicit. So you know both the representations you get uh, in your hands, you get the matrices for the monodromy, but you also have the, uh, the, the Higgs bundles because essentially ho ho variations of Hodge structure ho are very special kinds of Higgs bundles with uh, some very degenerate uh, properties of the, of the Higgs field. So there, there's the C star action and in particular they're fixed points of the C star action. So, uh, so Hodge theory is, is kind of a, a nice place where these two objects are both very explicit and computable. So I, I tried to show you in this talk both the matrices, the, you can see the monodromy matrices in your hands. You can also compute the, so the, the, the functions that I had on the first slide, they're essentially some data which, from which you can read off things like a, a Higgs field or how uh, certain bundles vary. So certain analytic objects and how, how they behave. So the other thing is that families, usually of algebraic varieties, have uh, degenerations. You almost never have a family over a compact base. And so uh, you really have to deal with unipotents. So you, in, in fact, most of the time, you can only understand this group when it's generated by unipotents. And so you, you need a technology to, to deal with this. I don't know if some of this exists or to, to, to what extent, but it, uh, once one has concrete examples, we can actually prove stuff about them. So uh, the objects, these, the, the, the object that I had on the last slide, this Y gamma, is uh, an object which is, I think, potentially of interest to algebraic geometers and to people who are interested in arithmetic. So these hypergeometric functions are really objects that occur in different branches, like number theory and uh, analysis and so on. So uh, I'll end here. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Did you say that it looks like a closing curve or what? 
so, so, so there are two limit sets. Uh, yeah, so, so this lambda gamma, uh, which is in the projective space, it should look more or less like a, like, like a curve. Like it should be in particular, I think, connected. And it should be, uh, yeah, so, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of like a, what did you say, quasi, or like something like in the quasi Fuchs in your presentations. So, it, but it's in three space. And the other guy is kind of like a cylinder. So it's, it's a collection. Uh, so for each point in this curve, you have another circle that goes around the Grassmannian. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is what the other limit set looks like. And if you look at the complement of that, you'll get the, the main of this continuity. And I should say that these uh, bad, what I called bad of F2s, they actually go around twice. So they go around twice the Lagrangian, uh, Grassmannian. So, so if you think about it somehow, this, uh, if you consider kind of one slice, which is a sphere, there's a, you know, it, it has some curve in it, like in the Lagrangian Grassmannian. It has a curve and it has two components, but this guy winds around twice. So this is how you get this identification with, uh, uh, w w with, this, uh, with a circle bundle. I mean, you, you can get rid of torsion by passing to the right finite index subgroup. So uh, the, the torsion is fair. Uh, so, so, so the, the one thing that I, I found very difficult to, to to kind of wrap my mind around in this situation is that you have somehow uh, the, the maximal representations I'm thinking of as something that achieves the Milner wood inequality. Maximal representations I'm thinking of as something that achieves the Milner wood inequality. Whereas somehow here you, you're really saying that the Lapinov exponents are as small as they're allowed to be by a topological constraint. So, uh, so, so, so this is why, uh, so, so I, 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 I try to understand how these, uh, what's the relationship to maximal representations, but the, 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 there's somehow two different regimes, but it could be that there's a relationship. So I'd, I'd be happy to talk about this. No, no, I, I said that it's the opposite type. So Milner Wood is something from above, and this is something from below. One question is which order does the proof go? I mean, one is sure that this act probably cannot act probably to this continuum of the R. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you would want to apply Benoit's criterion to prove that something is a nozzle. What do you actually have to prove and what follows then? So, so, so Benoit's criterion is something of the type that if you have a group and if you can control the singular values of the element, so if you can say that, for example, the singular values stay away from an axis, then, uh, or there are only finally many in some neighborhood, then the action is properly discontinuous. So you, you can check this by just use it, playing with the cones. And similarly with the proper discontinuity on this uh, omega, L omega, you again want to check that if there's some infinite sequence of of transformations going off to infinity doing something you don't like, you want to get a contradiction to show proper discontinuity. And again, you just do it with cones. And I mean, you, you, ha you have the matrices, you can just. But you have to do both statements independently. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're independent. Yeah, so, so, so the, the, this is why the Benoit criterion was under more dot, dot, dot. It was not, it's not directly necessary for the, uh, 
formula for the Lapinov exponents.